Andrea, you ready? I'm All right. ready. All right. I want to welcome everybody to this episode of Kettlebell Corner, where we have Strong First Master Trainer, owner of Kettability in Seattle, motorcycle rider, strength and performance coach, badass, Andrea Chang. Thank you <laughs> so much. If you want, give us uh, 15 seconds about yourself and uh, a quick intro. Um, like you said, I'm Andrea Yushi Chang. I'm up here in Seattle, but I'm actually originally from New Mexico. And I started with Strong First or actually started with Pavel 15 years ago in 2006. Uh, I was doing the numbers the other day with Brad Jones and we were like, oh my goodness, that's crazy. So um, Zara Horton, who is my childhood friend, we've known each other since we were 10 years old. Um, he's the guy who got me into kettlebells and it changed my life and it allowed me to want to change other people's lives and sort of my real estate job segued into owning a gym and just loving it and bringing more people into strength, ability, fitness, ability. And uh, that's kind of how Kettability was was born. And that's sort of what, what we're doing. And so I co-own it now with my husband, Vic Verdier, who's a, an elite strong person instructor and a master uh, move nat. Uh, instructor and also a GFM instructor, you know, all the, all the things, FMS, blah, blah, blah. You know, we all have a bunch of stuff behind our names, but uh, mm -hmm. we're running the gym together and, and partnering with Zar. Uh, we've been business partners and friends for years. And we have our thing that we do together is um, HC performance, Horton Chang performance. And we run and are um, event coordinators for Strong First and teach for obviously for strong first. And I guess the last little plug is Vic, Zar and I, um, Zar and I have, we have so many like cues and teaching tips and things that we've come up with over the years that um, we put together. On a podcast together, real quick and then I'll. Um, uh, had, uh, we put together a, a, um, a something, a, a product for instructors only, for strong first instructors only called the instructor's toolbox which is all about how do you fix cleans? How do you fix the form for different things? And we have that on uh, the strong first instructor only portion of the site. Um, so that's something that a lot of people don't actually know about is once you get your certification, there is a portion of the site that's just for people that have their certifications, the coaches. So there you go. Wow. Wonderful. Sounds like you got a lot going on and uh, kettlebells a <laughs> uh, major factor. I think like most people, major. Uh, yeah, it seems that kettlebells do just change lives uh, as they go along. Uh, in fact, I, I do have something that I wanted to talk about as far as kettlebells and I'm actually going to be a little selfish myself and kick it off with a lesson that I learned from you. Um, and I just would like to elaborate and share that. Um, okay. you maybe think of one thing, but it's probably, um, so, you know, in SFG2, you got to get a half body weight press up. And I think that's a good goal for anybody in strength training um, is getting a half body weight press up. And some, I, I subsequently, if you weren't there, uh, I failed at it. And, um, uh, you know, it is neither here nor there back to the training drawing board, but I was given some really good advice by you. And uh, you suggested that doing a heavy clean and a squat in the rack position with your test size bell would help develop the press. And um, I have like actually two parts. I want to know a little bit more why that is. Mm -hmm. And um, what could somebody who doesn't quite have access to a half body weight bell to do something like this with do to help get them even closer? Let's say if they only have like their snatch test size bell, mm -hmm. but I'll let you, okay. let you elaborate. I'll, I'll start with the first part, which is um, I think that what, because in 2019, uh, and it's progressed from there. We have uh, one of our students and somebody who comes, who's in the Pacific Northwest, um, Kat Buckley actually just did a, an article for Strong First about the sort of like the tidy up training protocol, which includes this sort of clean squat, um, a swing clean squat scenario, sort of complex that we use. And actually Deb Garnett's used it, a bunch of people that I coach have used, I use this because it's so effective for helping people get a really heavy press. And why, why does something as simple as like one swing, two cleans and three front squats, single arm, why is it so effective? Well, one of the reasons it's so effective is because it's time under load. You know, you have something heavy that's trying to pull you out of whack. You know, you have to organize your body against 
the forces of this bell that's trying to pull you out of center, out of stability, taking your cylinder and making it sort of sh change shape, right? So you have to keep your cylinder, which is your torso from your collarbones to your pubic bone, that cylinder has to be intact in order for this to happen. So I guess to precede this, the skill level for the, the, the one swing, the two cleans and the three front squats have, has to be impeccable. If there's any compensation there, then this particular thing doesn't work effectively. But what it does, it gives you time under load and it forces you to be able to hold this heavier bell in the rack during a bunch of stuff. So it gives you practice with the clean, which you need a good clean to be able to actually perform the half body white prep, the, the strength press for the level two. And you also need to be able to hold it in place and get, I guess I would term it easy, become easy with the load. Meaning if you clean the bell and you start to freak out immediately when it hits the rack, you're never going to be able to get a good press, you know, learning how to grind through um, this really powerful, slow strength movement that is these, these heavy presses is difficult and it can be very scary for people or you start to like make it into your head, something that's more than it is. So if you work on um, work capacity under a load, holding your form, it just makes it when you decide to push so much easier. Does that make yeah, sense? I think that's great. Yeah, totally. Why, that's why I love it so much. And if you, you know, what I suggest for people is, um, and you can vary the reps and you can do static start or single rep cleans from the ground if you really want to get into owning the clean portion before the press, because sometimes the clean actually messes up your press if you don't really get it well, get it, the skill of that um, isn't very high. Um, but uh, it's best to do it with a bell that's two or three sizes heavier than the bell you want to press. So the tricky thing is, what happens what if it's the if beast? You, what if it's the beast? Right. Um, you might do a tempo, you might do a pause, you might work this bottoms up with a bell that you can cope with, the heaviest one that you can do. Um, you just spend a little bit longer time. You might up the reps a little bit. So for some people, it could be one, two, three, you know, one swing, two cleans, three front squats. If you're actually using the load, it could be two, three, five that type of thing, or even a little greater, but I would do three to five sets of this separated by time. I think that the slow strength tends to, um, get stronger and neurologically it's difficult for the central nervous system, uh, these heavy loads. And so if you take more time, I think Pavel has said in many of his books, um, that, that if you take more time between your strength sets, you actually access different types of muscle fibers and you get stronger, I think faster. You don't get bigger, but you get stronger. So if you're looking for hypertrophy, then you want to bunch your sets together. Got it. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, it's just time under tension, giving yourself some time to rest in between and really just mm -hmm. focusing on that. And it seems like, you know, some things you weaved in there as far as like, if you don't have the weight that you need, um, just going slower, uh, holding mm -hmm. things a little bit longer, creating even more time under tension could help if Absolutely. you don't have that extra weight. Absolutely. Because what you're trying to do is when you get the clean with that 48 or the 24 or the 20 or the whatever it is that you're the 36, what it, 40, whatever the bell is that you're trying to get, um, you don't want the clean into the rack to be the hardest thing. <laughs> you want to feel super comfortable with that bell so that when you, when you start to press and it gets grindy and hard, your body has already learned how to stabilize and root into the ground. And so then it's just that much easier. You don't have to focus on so much. So having some habits, good habits, and that's where the skill practice of being really precise about this is so important because if you do a janky clean, um, if you don't get your rack position really tight, um, if you don't hold that, all that, uh, pressure, all the tension appropriately, then, then you're not teaching your brain to teach your body what to do when it gets 
heavy. Then you kind of freak out and then people start to, you know, jerk it up or blast it off or, or start to get, you know, do weird things, scared. weird yeah. things occur. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's totally, that's totally makes sense. Get, get it there and make all your effort be in the actual press as opposed to thinking about the clean to get it there. All right. Awesome. Roger, Absolutely. what you got? Um, I'd actually like to, to jump off something you just mentioned. Um, you were talking about the rack position and the importance of it. I think a lot of people mm-hmm. don't get that. What are you looking for when, when you're evaluating a rack, when you're teaching a rack? Well, it depends on the load, right? Um, and I think you guys did a really nice post about the rack position. Like we, we want to go for a vertical forearm. Absolutely. Um, and we want to go for a neutral wrist. However, the bigger the bell, um, the more offset your forearm may be because you really want to centrate or center the load. So if the bell and your hand are huge, you know, then it's going to maybe be over here. We want to basically make sure that the load is over the elbow. If you're strong enough to keep a vertical forearm with whatever load it is, absolutely do so. You'll get way, way more out of it. But at certain points, especially with big bells, depending on the size of the person, you might have a little bit of a shift in, in that rack position. Um, so that's in terms of, you know, uh, side to side, you want it vertical. And then you also want to try to get it vertical down here. You want to really compress and get that really, really tight because you're asking your body to ha- create such, you know, it's sort of like, do you want to push a sandbag or do you want to push a brick? You know, you have to make your body into a brick in order for, the bell to go where you want it to go. If you are a sandbag, then it's just, it's just really difficult to get it to go. So working on, um, that really strong rack position. So doing a lot of rack marches, rack, um, carries all that stuff is, you know, I, I think, uh, I read and heard and I train, uh, isometric holds should be about isometric should be up about 10% of your, your training volume. And that can be done in a lot of different ways. And luckily with kettlebells, we can do a bunch of isometrics and still be moving at the same time, you know, pharma carries, marches, you know, X, Y, Z, that kind of stuff. What are, what are the points of contact you're looking for? Um, anything in specific between the, the arm and the body? Um, I like to, people to visualize. I mean, we can use a bunch of, you know, big words. I wanted to get your lat to activate and push against your stuff, you know, but really what you want to do is you want to squeeze your upper arm, your arm into your torso. So imagine you have a sponge in your armpit and when it hits the rack, it's squeezing into your body as you are lengthening. So your torso is tall um, and you're squeezing and lengthening through the you know, you're taking your cylinder and pushing it all the way down to the floor through your heels, you know? So, um, that's what I would be looking for. Um, where the bell sits, um, depends on, you know, your, how how your body is set up. How long is your, you know, your forearm, how long is your, you know, your upper arm. Some people have really short upper arms and really, really, and so their bells are in a different position. So that all that other stuff is determined by, how your body is put together. And that's why working with our principal set is just that, you know, we're trying to get a strong neutral spine, neutral neck, um, appropriate tension. Um, When we're packing our shoulder, people think it's depression, but it really isn't. You're actually trying to squeeze in and get taller against the load instead of just drop, trying to push the shoulder down as hard as you can. You know, there's a difference to that because people can actually hard style themselves into positions that aren't really healthy for the body. That works. What do you got, Jeremiah? Um, uh, that's a, we all should be able to do a a much better press after hearing, hearing all that for sure. Uh, I can't wait to go try it this afternoon. Um, I want to talk a little bit, uh, I I see, you know, uh, you know, you do get ups on a, on a regular basis. And I, and I was just curious, you know, um, there are some coaches that will watch this and are on here. And if your students are doing the get up, what part are you seeing that they have typically the most difficult with and how are you helping them uh, pass that? Is it like the roll? Is it, is it the way back down? Which, which parts? Um, 
I think for most people, the two most difficult positions in the getup are um, from the ground rolling to the elbow. So the very first position to the elbow um, and um, the tall seated position. Usually if people can get those two, uh, they, you can work them through the rest of the stuff. Occasionally people have, will have problem with the lunge position because their overhead mobility, the thoracic extension isn't where it needs to be, or they have some shoulder issues. And then that's a, that's a whole nother animal. But let's just say for people that have relatively good overhead capacity, um, the two diff most difficult positions to coach and for people to understand the drive and where the load goes is, um, the roll to the elbow and then from, from the elbow to the stall, tall seated position with the hand on the floor. What, uh, that tall seated, I, I expect, I kind of expect the, the role as being like kind of a challenge because people saw, tend to make it like some weird sit up type of thing, just cause mm -hmm. it's not used to the role. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, it's not the Turkish or the, or the roll up. So people get mm -hmm. a little confused that, you know, it's like, Oh, right. get up. Let me get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. that tall seated position. What, what is it? What is it? Is it just like core stability? Is it, you know, just well, like be, it, tell me about that a little more. Yeah. I think that, uh, what I've seen over the years and especially recently, I've seen a lot of people with some really, really tight hips coming through and that exhibits themselves ex exhibits the most in the, uh, the tall seated position, because I think maybe arguably that's the hardest position to own in the getup because you have to keep, you know, you've got your arm against the ground and you're having to roll that shoulder back down and keep it connected as you're overhead and your leg needs to be out and straight. The other needs to, needs to be up and you have to be positioned so that when you begin to create that arch between the foot and the hand, as you are sweeping their leg and pulling your leg back, whether it's a low sweep or a high bridge or some mutation between the two, you have to create the right architecture in order to pull and move to the next step. So what happens is people don't understand how to organize their body around uh, keeping the shoulders connected with the torso, right? So either they shrug on the bell side or they shrug or bend the elbow on the downside. And usually that's because they're so tight in their hips that they can't keep their long legs straight and their other leg bent to be in the right position. So some simple fixes is, you know, uh, in our system in the strong first system, you know, we, we believe that safety is performance and performance is safety. And so if I had to choose between um, somebody keeping their shoulder and their arms straight to post, to be able to take that load overhead safely, to be able to pull their leg through and, or to keep their legs straight on the floor, I'd rather them keep their shoulder connected and their arms straight. So what we found is if you allow that long leg to bend just a little bit, you know, uh, in that tall seated position, a lot of people can open up quite a bit, but it's sort of like, you know, it's like flossing. Um, if you straighten here and you straighten there, something bends somewhere. So you can either have it on this side or you can have it on that side for some people. Now, does it mean that that's the best practice? No, we want everyone to have all of the things, but as you're moving into it, this might be a stage and it's perfectly fine for our standards to be able to have that, that long leg to be bent so that you can get up and sit up through the torso to keep that shoulder connected. Excellent. And then, you know, obviously, you know, you just work through, through some of the mobility stuff, uh, through absolutely. the course of your training and stuff like that. Awesome. awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then like the roll to the elbow, you know, we're all, it, um, you guys were talking about how Roger was talking about how people, it's not a sit up, it's a diagonal push. And really the, you know, Zara and I talk about it all the time. It's just architecture, you know, it's physics, you know? So if your shoulders are here and you're trying to go up like this, you know, rolling up this way, instead of diagonal, you got to get that. If this is your bell shoulder, you got to get it over the down shoulder fast, as fast as possible. So it's a diagonal movement and holding the principles of the shoulder connection to the torso together driving with the leg 
usually helps once people understand where that drive comes from. Although it might be harder in the beginning because there's a lot of things to think about, once they get it, it makes for a much stronger getup for sure. Agreed. Um, so uh, let's let's uh, change direction slightly. Um, okay. We like to think in terms of attributes or, or training qualities. You'd mentioned, okay. especially during the press, uh, the idea of this the cylinder, this this core mm-hmm. connection. Um, this may or may not be one of them, but what what do you think are the top three um, attributes, qualities, things that people who do kettlebells should train? Just three. Just three attributes. Um, Wow, that's really hard. Um, can one of them be all the stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the stuff and then everything else and whatever you yeah. missed. Perfect. <laughs> right. Um, uh, I think. All right. Uh, I think uh, postural alignment postural alignment and skill. So doing the things, uh, so that would be the first one, postural alignment slash skill. I'm going to like make it harder because I'm going to add things in there. Um, but you have to have your body set up your body, how your body is built has to be set up in the right way for you to achieve the skill timing for all the different lifts. Okay. Um, so that would, that's would be, so we talk about how the cylinder works, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're opening your ribs or if you're tucking your tailbone in the wrong place, or you're losing tension. Um, so I would say postural alignment and skill practice. Uh, the second thing would be power production. Absolutely. Because kettlebells are fantastic for ballistics and you can use that in so many different ways. It can be heavy ballistics. It can be super light sprint ballistics, like with a, like a a jump stretch band where you're doing wicked fast, really light swings, like, like you're sprinting. Um, and that can be done. That's a different skill set that's fast and quick, you know, whereas, you know, maybe going really, really heavy doing some of the anti-glycolytic protocols, which would be called for a much, much heavier bell with a lot of extra rest in there. So you can use those two different, you need to be able to train all that stuff, but that all comes down to what kind of power production. I think power production is really important. So in that under power production, that means you got to get your breathing right. You got to get your tension right. You got to get your timing right in order for all that to happen correctly. Um, And then I think uh, work capacity for me, because as an aging human being, Uh, if you don't have the work capacity to defy gravity, you don't have anything. And uh, what I see with our older students that come into the studio, I mean, so many of them are, are, um, deconditioned and a little broken because of the things they have or have not been doing for a really, really long time. And our job is to get them, you know, posturally lined and have enough skill to be able to endure workload. So work capacity, super important. And so, and that <clears throat> falls into supporting all the grinds, you know, slow strength. And, um, you know, cause I forget who's, who said this question is, it's probably heard it from Pavel. Um, would you rather pick up something really, 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 really heavy once, or would you like to carry something somewhat heavy for five minutes? Well, you know, I think I would rather pick up something relatively heavy and be able to carry it or do something with it for a longer period of time. And I'm not talking swings, I'm talking grinds or isometrics or that type of thing, because that is sort of what forces your body to integrate under that load so that, you know, you have the work capacity to sit up straight in your chair. It's as simple as that, you know? Awesome. Um, it's, it's not my turn, but I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead anyway. Um, <laughs> hey now. now you, you, you had mentioned, you'd mentioned power and, and something that, um, is fascinating with me. It's something, some, uh, to me, something I have a really hard time with sometimes 
the people who do not understand power production, I'm talking about beginners, people who let's say they can go through their squats, their hinges, all of, they can do all of the stuff. They can hit the positions, but they do not comprehend fast. Um, what, what do you, what do you do to teach somebody who seems to be unable to innately produce power? How do you get them moving fast? Is it like threats, um, lighters, thumbtacks? What do you do? Um, well, I guess you have to find out maybe why some questions, like why is it that they are, or do they think they're moving fast and they just aren't? Or is there some other reason that they're putting the roadblocks on? Um, and sometimes people think they're moving fast and they don't realize that they're not, right? Um, uh, the easiest thing is to get someone to go sprinting, but a lot of people just can't do that anymore, right? Because if you work with certain populations, um, I'm just going to say, let's say a general, you know, midlife desk athlete, you know, you're not going to go, hey, you know, go how fast, show me how fast you can run for 100 you know, hundred feet. You're not going to do that because they'll pull something or snap something while they're doing it. They're not prepared to do that type of thing. But if you get somebody doing a relatively good swing, like I said, you could do these over, over, um, um, eccentric overspeed swings by hooking them up to a band and it forces them to move fast. But, you know, if you end up doing these, um, you want to use a much lighter bell. Let's say they can do, uh, I think of a working weight two hand swing bell would be uh, a bell that somebody could swing with perfect form, crisp, doesn't matter how fast, how much power production, but crisp and clean with good skill for 20 swings. And they can maintain that level of skill and quickness, um, breathing, all the things for 20 swings. And then above 20, it starts to decay a little bit is something decays. Usually it's the quickness of the, of the movement. So if that's their working weight bell, let's say it's a 20 kilogram, they probably would only be doing these overspeed uh, eccentrics with like a 12 or a 14 or maybe a 16. So quite a bit lighter because the whole idea is to force the body to move quickly. You still have to hit your tall standing plank. You still have to hit your tension. You still have to get your breathing, but the turnaround is so much faster. And, um, it's sort of like, you know, I played soccer in college and my coach, this is really way back in the old days where, you know, our coaching was eh, not as good as it could have been. And so, Oh, Chang run faster. Well, how do I do that? Just go faster. You know, that's, that's not helpful. But what we do now is that quickness for sprinters is all driven by arm, arm rate turnover. So it's the upper body that drives the lower body. So, you know, people don't, you know, you don't have to do sprints or, you know, threaten somebody with something. You just get them to do something that forces that turnover rate to be faster. And those overspeed eccentric swings force people to respond quickly. And it's a shock to them. But once they feel it, then they can start generalizing it to other things that you do in different sizes of bells. So you can do like in the, in the strong first level one manual, there's the push the bell over speed eccentric drill. It would be something like that, but you can set up with a band. So you could actually have a whole group class to do it together and all freak out about how hard it is, you know, type of thing. Yeah. The freak out. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> we call those aha moments. <laughs> oh yeah. It's either aha or, Oh, Freak. Um, <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the resiliency and like, you know, our quest to be strong for life. Um, what are, so, so just in general, let's just say, Hey, we work with kettlebells. I want you to be strong for life. What, and, and this can be stuff that you do as well. What are three skills, movements, or strategies that you're using for yourself or that you suggest to some of your students to kind of build that res resiliency and that strength for life type of type of approach. Mm -hmm. um, well, everything starts with movement literacy. If you don't know where your body is in space and time, it's very difficult to 
I mean, you can think you're training something, but probably you're compensating in some particular way. So making sure that you can move in all planes as best as you can with fluidity and strength. So this would be sort of like, a, you know, uh, Peter Lakatos came up with a system based on functional movement correctives called ground force method. And um, luckily I get to use that all the time. And so making sure that there is a sort of a uh, functional movement, body weight flow that you can do that helps you with your movement literacy from a neurological perspective, I think is pretty important for longevity and durability. Um, it's not just crawling. It's a lot, of, a lot of odd angle loading and that kind of stuff. Um, so I would say movement literacy is really, really important. And then I would say um, that for me, there are, it's pretty simple. Um, if I only need, had to do two things, it would be swings and push-ups, just two. <laughs> that would be enough to be able to get most of what you need. But, you know, everybody wants to do more. And I also want to do more. I, would, I like all the things, you know. So when people say, say, you know, what's your favorite thing? Well, they're kind of all my favorite thing. Um, you need to be able to be quick. And if you can't run, then fast swings or snatches or king. Um, if, if you need to be able to be strong enough to defy gravity, then owning a push up or a pull up is important. So body weight stuff is really important. And then picking up enough heavy stuff to have some work capacity and resiliency that is just not a one-off, you know? Uh, so training a relatively heavy deadlift, you know, um, the path that that takes you on waving the load in between, you know, something that would be, I don't know, like one and a half to one and three quarter body weight type of thing, just for your, your normal average person, a little heavier for men, a little lighter for women, depending um, who you are and what the person you're working with, you know, they should be able to pick up their body plus another half should be not a problem. Um, so that's sort of the work capacity for the grinds and then the, the power production and then just mobility. So the mobility stuff could be ground force method. It could be any, you know, yoga, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you know, it can be um, all the other things that you can do um, on the floor. Get-ups are great for that kind of stuff. And those are loaded, you know, but I would consider those sort of like a, a loaded isometric mobility drill for sure. Does awesome. That I think, it, sort yeah, of? that's, that's great. I, I mean, I think it's very helpful. I, I feel like, you know, that's, that's something, you know, everybody should account for as they go through their life is how can I sustain whatever I'm doing? Um, you hit on a couple of things as far as like the work capacity and be able to do things a long time. Everybody wants to carry all the groceries on one trip. Let's not, let's not get it twisted. So, you know, put it in there. That's, yeah. that's very good. Roger, what do you yeah. got? So I want to talk about grip, um, you know, in visiting, in visiting your, your studio, um, there's a, I, I hope it's still there. There was a wall of grippers, which I, I don't, I don't usually see when I go into these facilities. And I, yeah. I just remember, you know, trying to focus on the task at hand and also wanting to squeeze all of them. Um, <laughs> or try to squeeze all of them. Yeah. Well, I, I'll use my legs if I need to, but um <laughs> Do you do one, I guess, do you think people train grip enough? Uh, and two, what, what are some strategies that have been helpful, um, for you to train it and incorporate it? I have tiny little baby hands. So when I grip, when I train my grip too much, it really, uh, I haven't found a way to train it effectively consistently without negatively impacting, um, my kettlebell like training. Your, your elbows and such. It's, it's not elbows. It just, it's just fatigue. Um, it's just fatigue. Yeah. For the most part, and, you know, it's like, I, I, I can only do it so much. And I'm just wondering if you've got any, any strategies that you use uh, to work with, with your students. Well, we do a lot of hang time, just hang body weight on a bar as long as you can. Um, Edo Portal has a really nice sequence of things that build actually builds up to a one arm chin. Um, and it starts with one minute hang with your thumb. Um, 
with a one minute rest times five. So it's not like you would be able to hit that today. Maybe you could, um, but over time being able to get that will definitely increase your grip strength because that's such a huge pulling. Plus it's brachiation. Um, it's really good for your shoulders. If anybody has overhead issues, being able to hang just a loose, relaxed hang. You're not, your shoulders are not packed. So you step off gently and you just hang. So that's one way to work on grip is just body weight hold. Um, the other thing would be, um, you know, those grippers, they're cool, but it's very specialized. It's very specialized, you know? So the people that really get into like bending nails and doing those grippers and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, the, there's a place of, of uh, less returns on that because it becomes so specialized that people like, um, what's it called when you like have a blowout your, uh, can't think of what it's called now. Um, like you pressurize so much that you have a hernia. People give themselves hernias and all kinds of weird stuff because the intra-abdominal pressure to create, to actually get some of those grippers closed is so intense, you know? So that's like arm wrestling. It's specialized. So we're, those are kind of there for fun and for people to go, Oh my God, there's a four. Good. Nothing happens, you know? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of like grip strength, that will be helpful. Bottoms up do lots of bottoms up stuff, bottoms up and hangs and uh, farmer carries. Uh, but just take care of your elbows, you know, make sure that you're doing a lot of um, forearm work to keep the fascia flexible around your elbows, because sometimes a lot of that grip stuff tends to impact the elbows in not such a positive way. Do you have a recommendation on uh, frequency? How often will you incorporate something like that? Um, well, I, I prefer, not everybody is, not everybody is set up to be able to do this. Um, but more and more people, especially after this whole lockdown pandemic have more tools at home than they've ever had before. Um, so the goal would be to do a little bit all day long, you know, so every hour on top of the hour. Um, and, and a lot of times when I give people at home training protocols and they have the tools to be able to do these things, it's, I prefer people to do things on the hour. And, uh, I recently, a video will go up on Kettability soon. Um, had a gal who did not have uh, a pull. She had a chin barely. And so we worked and now she has this absolutely beautiful pull up now and a uh, tactical pull up. And now she's doing pull ups on, on those like wooden dowels, you know, she's, and it's just because she's been greasing the groove a little bit all day long. Cause she's works at a desk, but she has all the stuff at home now. So every hour she has a little protocol that I've written for her that she goes and she does every hour and it takes maybe 10 minutes and it, it grows sort of exponentially. And that's, you know, there's a book, easy strength, and there's, there's all different ways of doing this, but we call it greasing the groove. And it's, it's very, very effective because you're always doing high skilled work, but you're doing it throughout the day and you can get as many sets in as you can do. That's what I would no, suggest. And you, and you can do that every day. Um, I would say that, you know, let your, let your body give you the answer, you know, guide you a little bit. If you're feeling obviously fatigued or you're not sleeping well, that's, you know, it's a, that's like a rest day. You should have, people should have at least one like real rest day um, during a week, at least one, but you can train something every day and you can train that kind of stuff. As long as you're not having any, any bad effects, I don't see any reason not to train that type of grease, the groove stuff carefully. You can do that quite often. Three to awesome. three to five times a week. I'm going to do it immediately following this. And, um, <laughs> so obviously I need to work on the press and Roger needs to work on his grip strength. So okay. what should you be training more? What should I be training more? Yeah. Well, what do you need to work on? I need to work on my snatches and I'll tell you why, because, um, I have a really big, stupid dog, um, a puppy and he pulled me on my face like water skiing about, mm, it's probably been nine months now. And so I wasn't able to do anything overhead or even do pushups for about four or five months. It took me a long time to come back from that. And I've had shoulders or, you know, whatever stuff. 
Um, and so I'm getting back into snatching again and loving it. And so that's what I'm working on right now is snatching. Cause I can do awesome. it again. Finally. Yay. That's right. It's a good feeling when that happens. These yeah. Darn dogs pulling our, pulling our bodies apart. Sometimes I oh, guess boy. cats might be the way to go. Yeah, um, well, I guess it depends who you ask. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Roger, you got anything else? Do you want to open it up to, to any questions to be filed? All right. So, uh, anybody have any questions and you can just unmute yourself and say your name and ask away and, um, elaborate or, or wonder and just go ahead and ask. It's a safe place. All right. Nobody I'll go asks, again. I'll ask again. Okay. No, no, no. It's my turn. Um, so, you know, we're talking about snatching and, you know, I, I, uh, I remember coming across one of your workouts in this, uh, RKC workout book. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, you've been doing this for a while. Um, yeah. how do you feel about the direction, the evolution of, of the snatch from, you know, RKC to present, um, good direction, bad direction, what's changed, what's the, what's the most impactful change? Uh, I actually don't think it's changed all that much. I know that that might be, you know, shocking. I think how we teach it has changed over the years and we have how we, how we teach instructors, you know, to teach it. And, and all this is predicated on us doing a lot of, you know, beta testing with all the different protocols. And, and it's kind of funny because a lot of the, um, uh, the teaching staff for strong first, the master instructors, the seniors, the team leaders, um, some, a lot of us will be doing similar things on different places in the world, but we're kind of all coming along in the same kind of way, which I think is kind of pretty interesting. Um, but how things are taught at certs, um, like we're changing to, um, or codifying it to start a, a protocol, which starts with a bent arm, like a T-Rex swing that turns into a snatch. Um, Zara and I have been teaching that for ages as an option, you know, teaching it from the top down is an option. Teaching the subtle high pull, which really is a bent arm swing. It, you know, um, uh, pulling it towards you and punching it. That's a bent arm swing. So we're just finding ways to more effectively teach somebody how to teach somebody. So it's not like you have to do it that way, but I think that it is because we are snatching heavier, because a lot of the, the anti-glycolytic uh, anti training protocols make it important to be able to snatch heavy, certain things have to occur when you snatch heavy. You know, it needs to be a more um, up and down motion rather than so much of an arc. You might get away with a little bit more of an arc um, and still be able to have the principle of it not banging on your wrist at the top, having that top of that snatch be crisp and strong and get that fixation moment at the top. But the heavier the bell is, the less easy it is, the harder it is to be able to get that fixation without using the stretch reflex of the shoulder to stop the bell's path if you're not going up and down. So one of the reasons we've come to teach, we've started teaching a more up down vertical path for the snatch is because we're hoping that people decide to in their toolbox of things that they do for themselves, power production um, is being able to snatch heavy because it can do a lot for your body. And these anti-glycolytic protocols are also all about resiliency because it doesn't go into tearing your body apart as you're training for these long durations. And, uh, it, they're just really effective. And even though I think um, a lot of people want to go, 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 and super high intensity stuff, this is high intensity, but it's brief high intensity. And then there's recovery, which you can work a lot of breathing protocols and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think people don't remember that high level athletes, you know, we're, what we're doing is we're training like high level athletes. We're, um, reverse engineering what they do. These top level sprinters at the Olympics, they don't sprint for hours. You know, they'll do their little sprint work and go 
whatever, 80%. And then they'll rest for 45 minutes before they do the next one. You know, it's not, they don't all fall to the wall because that would just totally destroy their system. And so I think it's great that our system has evolved to take more of those things into our practice and then how we teach it can help support that. But that doesn't mean that the way we taught it way back then, um, like in 2006 was wrong, same principle base. The principles are the same. The standards are the same. You know, you can't have it bonk on your wrist on the top. You can't be unsafe with your shoulders. You have to, you know, get that cylinder. You have to do all the things. It's just how we get there um, might evolve or specialize in certain ways. We're just trying to find the most effective, fastest way to teach somebody who's fresh, have instructors be able to teach most people something as quickly and effectively and safely as possible. Can I, can I throw a kudo out and make that point and kind of connect it to where I think Roger was taking it? Go for sure. it, Greg. Yeah. So, so here was a recent experience that I had that Andrea helped me through. Um, I, I was nursing a partially torn long bicep head on my right side, and so I was trying to get a little bit more efficient. And I learned the snatch basically from the high pool kind of method to where it's a little bit further out. And I was, and I think that's where you were going, right, Rod? Um, and, and so I was trying to, you know, start T-Rexing it, but it, 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 I, I wound up ultimately, but tearing it completely off, which long and short was a, a lifesaver because now I'm not in as much pain without it. So, but the long and the short is I really beat myself up and I had a conversation with Andrea about it. And uh, because I thought, you know, I just am having a hard time. I grooved that pattern so much. I'm having a hard time doing that. And she told me, look, you, your, your goal is to tame the art. Just get there as you get there. Just don't worry about it so much. And I got to tell you, man, that, that was a, a game changer for me, playing around with my snatches and trying to get more efficient. Because I don't put as much pressure on myself. And I certainly am not injuring myself anymore doing it. So I just wanted to throw that on top of your question, Roger, and then the kudo to Tom Drea, because man, that, that helped a lot just to take the yeah. pressure off of how poorly I was doing it and not doing it. Yeah. Well. well, you know, the principles, our standard is, is, is not this, you know, it's not one, it's not a very thin line. There's actually quite a bit of, of, I don't know, deviation from the center. You know, there's a little bit of breadth in the standard, but the standards are written for safety and performance. And so really in the snatch, we're looking for, does it yank on your shoulder? Is your shoulder disconnecting on the down and pulling you? Is it jerking you? Are you in control of the bell or is the bell in control of you? And so do you have a standing plank? Is your cylinder in the right position when you're going through the eccentric and the concentric? I mean, you know, so it's like, if those things are there, what it looks like can be highly variable for people. You can have a way out here snatch and have it land perfectly and be like, awesome, good. You know, and you can have something that comes up real tight, but somebody shrugging it up or dumping and that's no good, you know, because that's going to be an injury. It's just an injury waiting to happen, you know? So things can be look different. And they can be taught in a way that helps people understand. And then what they come to in their path for their own style within the principle set can be highly variable. And, and, I, and I think that, that, is, that was the lifesaver. That was a game changer for me because I think we get caught up sometimes in like chasing that perfection, especially when you hang around every day, somebody like soccer, you know, and so you're like chasing this thing. You're looking at your own stuff and you're like, I suck. You know, and and the truth is, I, I've got a way different level of mobility or lack mm -hmm. of than, than Czar does. I beat myself up. I'm an old dude. And so it's just bringing me back to the reality that, yeah, we have these standards, but within mm -hmm. those standards, like there's there's leeway, like really took a whole lot of pressure off of me and, and helped me sort of calm down and, and enjoy my skills training as opposed to just constantly walking around 
with a poor attitude about what that looked like, because that translates mm-hmm. itself physically to what you do uh, mm-hmm. in, in this world. So kudos. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, you know, I, I think that's, that's really great. helpful. I, I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, I, I had an interaction with someone recently, you know, now the, everything's kind of inverted. Now we're, we're the, the, the community seems to be going toward this low pole and you've got to snatch this way. It's got to be, you know, right up close to you. And he sent me a video and one, he had these tremendously long legs. Um, he is, he is really built to hinge, um, everything about his body. He had so much of a runway that to be able to turn that kettlebell on a dime and go, uh, from, you know, directly horizontal to directly vertical, it would need to be an L shape. And it was just unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. the second thing he was telling me, you know, I was, I was watching him. He had so much rotation going on and he said, what he was trying to do was snatch to his hip. And I said, slow down. And what I want you to do is I want you to let your arm hang down next to you and see where your dimensions physically are. Cause he did not, yeah. he had these really long legs, but he did not have very long arms oh, and, interesting. and where he was, where he was trying to snatch was, was basically right at the iliac crest. That's what he thought was appropriate because he had been told, yeah. you know, snatch to the hip, which is not a bad cue. But wow. when, when he's, when, when he's taking it, when he's taking it literally, you know, he had so much rotation, he was beating up his arms and it just was, it was not, it was not an attainable form for his body. And by, right. by working with standards and working within deviations, he, uh, he was able, you know, to, to get a, get into a much closer place. It just didn't look like, it didn't look like someone else who had, you know, this, this really tight vertical right. path. Some people can well, do it. Some people can't. We've seen thousands of people over the years, and that's why it's so cool. You know, people, I, I hope that people get out of the idea of it's supposed to look like this. I mean, in general, it's supposed to look like this. Yes, we get it. But in the discrete, it's about what does it look like in that person's body? You know, we've had people that have had like super, super short torsos, really long arms, really long legs. Their hinge if they're going to get the power production out of their glutes and their hamstrings is going to look squattier. It just does, you know, somebody who, who has a really, really long torso or some other type of sort of like, you know, setup, it's going to look different. It might be a more vertical shin if they have really, really short legs, you know, but you know, we've, we say that in our hinges that we're kind of looking for a vertical shin, but that actually really isn't even true because there's this really famous, I'll have to send it to you guys, picture of Pavel on a force plate when he's, he's swinging, you know, Pavel for a lot of years would be like, you know, one of the reasons we said vertical shin for a lot of our hinges was because in the early days, everyone came in squatting. Everyone was doing a squatty swing. And so the easiest thing to do is to say vertical shin, and they end up somewhere in the middle, which is an active loaded position, which is a more athletic stance, right? Because that athletic stance gets your glutes and your hamstrings together. But if you do a high hip swing, sort of the dippy bird thing with your hips, super, super high, that's almost all hamstring. And you actually have to disengage the bell on the upswing in order to be able to have it do anything. And that, that creates all kinds of rotation and other types of shoulder issues and torso cylinder issues with it. So um, just finding the pattern that's going to work, but the, still the principles are, are going on and should be principles for everybody. So your gentleman, you know, him having all that rotation, that's like a number one red flag, you know, got to fix the rotation. So what is he doing? How does he think it has to go? And I think when we're working as coaches with our students, half the battle is trying to get into their heads and figure out what they think they're supposed to be doing. Cause it could be, he thinks he's supposed to be pushing the belt to the center of his body. If you're, if your legs are like this and your you know, hips are here, the bell's not going to go in the center on a single arm snatch. You know, if you're doing double snatches, okay, they're going to go on either side. Two hand swings goes down the middle of the road, you know, single arm swings and snatches go down the sidewalk. I mean, it's going to go down, on one side. And if you try to pull it to the middle, you'll shift or rotate as a compensation. So having, trying to figure out what you, what your student is thinking helps you problem solve them as a coach. You can give them a cue that's going to help direct it to the right, a drill or a cue that's going to help them direct it to the right path. 
Awesome. Well, I think that's all the time we have. If everybody else has any questions, now's your time. Otherwise, I know I learned a lot and uh, can't wait to go do my kettlebell training today. Um, and uh, on behalf of both of us, Andrea, thank you so much for for powering home 22 hours from New Mexico to join us. And uh, we are so welcome. We are forever grateful. And there was just so much helpful tips. I'll I'll let you know thank when you. it comes out. And um, please. And again, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, s- stay strong. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming to join me on the Zoom. Appreciate it. Hope yeah, to see you all you, in everybody. person soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.